And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, creator of the upcoming TTRPG project Horizon Drifters, and a, and a man who un who understands the value of good trolling, the one and only Jonathan Dillon. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing excellent. How are you? I'm doing good. Um, counting down the days until until win until winter, though it's probably going to rain tonight. So I've got that. So I've got that going for me. At least that'll cut the heat. At least lessen it. For yeah. A while. So, I'd like. I usually start with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, with that in mind, walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what made it stick. Uh, so, I was 15 years old, and this kid I knew had bought a huge collection of Dungeons and Dragons books. Uh, so I bought them off of him for like $50, but all I ever got from him was Player's Handbook and like three other books, but like still way under value when I paid for them. Mm -hmm. uh, so then I played a game with a group of friends and it was cool, but like I didn't go anywhere because I didn't understand what was going on. But very quickly I met the people who he had sold those or bought those books from. And they liked me way more than him, it turned out. So after meeting me after the first game, they gave me all the books they'd been holding out on him and just kind of accepted me into their group. So for $50, I got roughly 200 Dungeons & Dragons books of different eras. And then, like, with that catalog, I was just so interested because there was just so much to read and so much to try. And, you know, my friends were just, like, huge gamers because that's all we did. It was just, it's a great escape. Mm -hmm. And 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 you can do anything. Like, it's, it's what I prefer about tabletop role-playing games over video games in that in a video game, I can only do what the video game is programmed to allow me to do. And in Dungeons & Dragons, or, you know, Pathfinder or Starfinder or Fantasy Flight Star Wars or any of the other games I've played, uh... It, you know, the, the options are endless in any situation. Eh, less so in combat. Combat, there's, I mean, it's it's endless, but they're, you're kind of in a, a functional routine. Mm -hmm. But even then, like, creative stuff is possible in combat. It's just not possible in your typical video game. Although, uh, Divinity Original Sin is getting closer to that, I think, and Divinity Original Sin 2 with... Like the combining magic effects and the environment. I can I can cer I can certainly see that. Uh, although I'd say I'd say that I'd say that try that the lev there's a reason why the whole why that whole your choices matter na narrative ended up dying a death a few years ago. Because when accounting for that amount of choices, the bra the branching narrative stops becoming a branching narrative and becomes a tumbleweed. Yeah, although that is one of the things I love about those Samurai Showdown games. Just like you got you got a day or two in a Samurai City, and there's like a million endings. <laughs> are you sure you're think? Are you? Aren't or you not Samurai of, Showdown? I'm thinking of. You're thinking of Way of the Samurai. Way of the Samurai, yeah. There, there are a number of samurai games I've played. Yeah. <laughs> and several samurai I've played in tabletop role-playing games. Yeah, although I I hope to God you didn't try and use the samurai class back in um back in back in Complete Warrior in third edition. No. Uh I do actually really like the fifth edition samurai. Um like it seems 
it's it's way better than I think than people realize because I mean it's simple it doesn't get a lot and its utility is weird that it gives wisdom to charisma check but whatever are you refer but, are you referring to the Kensei um no like no the samurai the fighter samurai in Xanathar's um its primary ability is three times per day you can get advantage on all attacks you make for a round and get five temporary hit points that goes up to 10 and 15. And that's like 15 it's, extra hit points a day. On one hand, I can see that. On the other hand, I, I remember looking at that and I wasn't all that impressed because it was a, it was a case of numbers go up. Well, sort of, but you have to look at another... Like, a lot of people take a lot of optional rules from 5e and just accept them as rules. Like, for example, flanking. Flanking is an optional rule. And you take flanking out, uh, which is something our tabletop group that I play with has done, and combat becomes a little bit more dynamic and a little bit tougher because it's not about just standing on either side of a dude and hitting him real easy. And, like, setting up a, a situation where someone has advantage is something that, you know, is now a huge deal. Whereas in most games, like, you just stand on either side, everybody's got advantage. Although to be f although to be fair, I suppose that's a slight step up from that from that blurb that was in the DM's guide for Five E. The whole oh oh you can you the which committed two sins. First off, trying to trying to act like um act like samurai fiction and wuxia are 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 similar, um, which is not the case. And anybody who has read Wuxia or Qiansha will argue until they're blue in the face about that, and they'll be and they'll be right. I'm not an expert, so I will cede to your superior knowledge. But the bigger crime was claim was claiming that you could make a samurai class by just reskinning the paladin. I don't know, like, in a weird way it makes kind of sense to me because of how oath-oriented samurais were. Yeah, the pro the problem that the problem is you're still- The supernatural st stuff is what doesn't fit. You're still- you're still a half-caster and how are you going- how are you go and, um... Since sword and board is- is the default for so many marsh for so many martial setups, how are you gonna do that in a culture that doesn't use shields? Well, the samurai didn't use shields. Their foot soldiers certainly did. Like the guys that had no money and spears. The yeah, but you're not you're not playing as a foot soldier. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's definitely not the exciting character to play. Because because you were there to die in the front lines while the generals just tell you where to go. Yeah. But that can't. Given the fact that you start that you started with D and D and and now you're doing Horizon Drifters, um, would it be fair of me to say that you jumped around between systems over the years instead yeah, of being a one I mean, system lifer? I played everything. I played like I mean I played a lot of Mech Warrior. I played some Shadowrun. Uh, I played some Maid, some Werewolves, uh, some Vampire. I sadly played some live action Vampire. Uh, but I you know, kink, it I don't kink shame unless I'm getting paid. Okay, I just it was it was the early nine the early two or late nineties, early two thousands. Like things were different. Like goth clubs were everywhere. And they let us play vampire in the goth club. Uh but anyways. No, I, I yeah, I played everything. Uh I actually tended to like science fiction based games better, but almost everyone I play with prefers uh fantasy. And I think that's just the divide we have literature that we grew up with. Like, because all of them grew up on Dragonlance. And while I read a lot of that stuff, I was also reading a lot of science fiction like Isaac Asimov and Arthur C. Clarke. And it just, you know, I find science fiction just way more interesting than I do fantasy. Even though, like, Lord of the Rings had a huge impact on me as a human being. Mm-hmm. Like, um, I was reading these books in grade school, and they were just blowing my mind. Yeah. And... To be... To be honest, I've, um... I've talked in the past about how, about how I think a lot of people have a very limited view on what constitutes fantasy. I.e. I that... 
this idea that fantasy has to begin and end with the with with that Western European pastiche. Oh yeah, I, there's there's a, like the thing is that's just predominantly what we're exposed to in English. There's a lot of folklore and mythology, like like for example, Joseph Campbell was a great guy who brought up a lot of that. In, in a lot of his work, aside from Hero with a Thousand Faces. Because um, he, he dug deep into the cultural things, and I think we're starting to see more of that coming out on our cinema because of, like, the influx of foreign stuff that's hitting our television. Yeah. Especially in the horror genre, where a lot of that seems to find a mainstay. Now, with that in, with that in mind... Horizon Drifters is is definitely meant to be science fiction, but the the thing the thing about about saying that something is science fiction or something is fantasy is that that can go in so many different ways. So I would define it as soft science fiction instead of hard science fiction. Pulp, uh, hard, soft versus hard. Uh, it's closer to space opera than like the three body problem. Like, hard science fiction is like The Expanse. Everything has a specific in-the-universe in explanation through science as to how it happens. Um, there's a huge debate in um, hard science fiction whether or not FTL can be considered hard science fiction because, you know, we can't do that right now. So, is that real? Uh, then... Soft science fictions like Star Wars, where you have things like the Force and, you know, everybody breathing the same atmosphere. You know, the kind of stuff that doesn't really belong in a coherent science fiction world, but you allow for to tell better stories. Mm -hmm. And for me... For me, the 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 thing that I find funny about the, about that FTL debate is we all is um in so many science in so many hard SF we have we have full on functional ships and yet and yet we can't and yet we can't um we can't have that amount of ex amount of extended space time so <laughs> yeah I mean it's 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 it's, it's a weird line to yeah. It's... But I mean, our game has all the stuff that, like, we've got magic, but it's not, it's themed in a way that makes sense in the galaxy, so that it's, it's, it's based, like, we have three magics, or three abilities that are like magic in a traditional tabletop role-playing game. We have Potentia Anima, which is like control of, like, the quantum realm of things that a sentient being can develop. We have, uh... Uh, stellar empowerment, which is uh, the ability to channel the power of the star that you're connected to into the material world. And then we have gravimancy, where you are connected to the places in the universe that hold great gravity, like uh, black holes and things, and you can use those powers to influence the world around you. Mm hmm. And then we have like melee and ranged, and that's like all of our combat powers. Yeah. But then each one functions with like a bunch of different things you can use the power for, mm -hmm. like, and all of them function similarly through those powers. Yeah. Now, with that with that in mind, there is one there is one tech level question that I want that I wanted to ask about, and that is how if. I'm assuming that FTL exists within this system, but how yes, but it made how it necessary it... because of wormhole technology. So people can open up a wormhole and go anywhere they want. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. If it was if it was something like the one week rule that Traveler has, or if it's um, instantaneous. If it's jump if it's jump points. It's it it's you open up a wormhole, go anywhere you want in the galaxy, uh, which the, sets up the interesting conflict with the Korok, who are our main villains for season one, because they actually don't have wormhole technology, even though they control a huge portion of the galaxy. They have like barely faster than light travel. So while their empire is growing, 
it's manageable because they know where the borders are. Whereas if this group of people had like wormhole technology, they'd be everywhere in the galaxy. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to wormholes, is it a case where you can generate a wormhole anywhere, um, almost anywhere in space, or are the wormholes fixed? You, your ship generates the wormhole for your ship. Uh, multiple ships can generate wormholes collectively so that they can all th go through together. Yeah. Uh, the wormhole is an important uh, mechanic for our game for uh, what we're calling uh, Event Horizons, mm -hmm. which are monthly games where in our uh, game, uh, Event Horizon, everyone's going to come together and essentially play the same game. Mm-hmm. And then there's going to be, like, plot decision points you make, like, do I help this person or this person? Do we save this artifact or this artifact? And then at the end of the Event Horizon, um, we tally up all the points, and then whichever one was the most chosen point, we have as the official version of what happened. And then we explain it as, you know, these pivotal points in the galaxy called Event Horizons pop up, and every wormhole that goes into there wormholes into a separate reality mm -hmm. so that essentially everyone does participate but at the end of the event horizon all of the probabilities collapse and then we're left with just what happened so that the people who were there only remember what happened uh, and then we also plan on making a fiction about the successful playthrough using uh, the characters from that playthrough and like highlights of what they did Mm -hmm. Probably like a 15 minute YouTube videos. Planning on putting a lot of the stuff through Blender animations. Yeah. Now, with that with that in mind, on the site it t you talked about a D6 Plus system. Um. Now, I can I could infer from that that you're using that you're using a D6 based die pool, but. Is it a success-based or a sum-based approach? Combination. So, let me explain. Every, every die roll in the game works like this. You have an ability score, and you have a skill related to that ability score. Mm -hmm. So, let's say you've got a 4 agility and a 3 ranged. So, you start off with four successes from your agility. And then you roll three d6s for your ranged, and it's four better as a success. Now, one of the dice that you roll is called the Stellar Influence die. That die on a one detracts from the total, and on a five or a six rolls again and adds to the total mm -hmm. and can continue to do so. Uh, I think the farthest we've rolled one of those out was nine rolls in the playtest where someone did something and it just kept rolling five or six. Uh, so he blew that check out of the water. Yeah. But So it allows for a variance and a, a hypothetical unlimited upward mobility, but you'd literally have to be the luckiest guy in the world to get really high numbers. So it, it, it keeps the checks changing within the numbers. But it gives you a base. And also, it's like if you're a really smart guy, you should be way better at stuff that you're not even trained in that a dumb guy who has two ranks in can do. You're just not going to be as good at, like, rolling the check up. Yeah. Now... A bit a potential issue that can that can happen with games that have that attribute and skilled skilled die pool is attributes become far, become far more te far more tempting to put development in. There it does because because of the fact that it affect, that it affects far more than ju than just a single type of role. Um, how do you how do you counteract that particular issue? Uh, well, your attributes go up to 5, and your skills go up to 10. So, hypothetically, once your skills are high enough, your skill values will be going up. Mm -hmm. um, and another thing that modifies the numbers are what we call PRMs, which stand for Personal Resource Modules. Um, our game doesn't have money. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really have equipment. It's not about 
filling stuff and getting stuff. That's not what our game's about. So, I mean, the, the, the combat is there, the metrics are there, but it's like a personal resource module is a series of nanobot, nanobots that will turn into anything you want them to turn into that will help you with a skill. And then based on how good you are with that skill determines how good that personal resource module is for you. So the personal resource module can be anything from a gun to a crown that makes people fall for your persuasion better to a cape that makes you really stealthy to whatever you can imagine. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, the player has like complete control over what their stuff is. I can, I can certainly get that. The way you described the die system was a little bit reminiscent of, um, of the D6 system from West End Games. I'm not sure if that was an influence or, or not. You know what? I'm a huge fan of those games. Uh, the the Star Wars West End games, were I, I had a lot of fun playing and mm -hmm. running games of that for a long time. Like, I had a ton of those books. Yeah, you'd probably get, you'd probably get a kick out of the re-up edition that fans had made. Yeah. Uh, which is basically an attempt to have a cleaned up uh, version of f of the of the of the game since well the last edition was revised and exp the last edition with the Star Wars name was revised and expanded the last technical version of that of that was D6 Space which was Star Wars D6 with all the legally with legally distinct words <laughs> but like the X Thing Fighter. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't, I don't recall, I don't recall what the legally distinct version of that was because it's been because it's been a while, but it's it's just one of those amusing th amusing things as a historian. Now, with that with that in mind, the other the other issue that can happen when it comes to a game that utilizes skills is the fact that skills can if if um not handled properly can result in analysis paralysis because of certain games that have way too many skills looking at you Shadowrun yeah Shadowrun has a lot of skills i love it for it because i'm often a crunch guy but yeah yeah Shadowrun has a lot of skills and and in Shadowrun you can't do it all <laughs> well not o not only that but because of how expensive it is to develop skills <laughs> You're almost encouraged to not expand your skill list from where it is at the start. Yeah. Everything's expensive in Shadowrun. Although the Hairbrained Schemes games are pretty good. Like, they're a solid, in my opinion, tabletop video game. On one hand, on one hand yes. On the other hand, um, it not is... Not good for replay. It is kind of it is kind of using the using the upgrade tree that we saw that we saw in Mass Effect. Yeah. For its skill for its skill system, which I which of course of course has of course has its has its own be has its own benefits and drawbacks. Um, the big problem that I have is is when a skill system has skill bloat. But I'm guessing you've take you've taken steps to try and avoid that problem. So, essentially, the so because we're an online game, we're going to be able to kind of control who you're playing with based on people of your like relative power level. So we have a couple of different metrics we're working on to try to determine like who are roughly the same level of people. Um, one of the primary determinants is your highest attack skill will be one of them, mm -hmm. um, and we think probably your three highest non-attack skills and then a couple of other things relating to your soak um so because we have uh we have a soak pool for like physical damage and then we have uh, a resistance pool for the like non-physical damage attacks so that it's not just a matter of protecting yourself from one thing but delineating what the attack is coming from mm -hmm. um also, in our game, everyone's immortal, because if you die, there's technology that basically teleports you, your body, all of your equipment, and if your spaceship AI says it, that nobody's on board your spaceship, 
to the nearest like quackery uh respawn or backup facility where your body is healed and rematerialized and then you go about your business again takes about a week Mm -hmm. and it changes the narrative where just killing the guy you're going after delays him by a week (laughs) yeah and with but even with even with that would it would be fair to would be fair to say that um, player characters will go will go down in a few good hits. Yeah, like that's there's at most in our game you can get I want to say twenty three physical integrity points. We call them pips. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really like that acronym, pip. But uh, there's twenty three of them, and you maybe it's 27 but I mean by the time you have most characters start between like 9 and 15 Mm -hmm. and then there's only so much higher you can go from there and it's it's pretty lethal like combat's pretty quick uh and then the NPCs are built off of an entirely different math skill where it's just a matter of assigning how many total value abilities they have Mm -hmm. so with with that with that kind of thing in mind uh, I can kind of get a grasp on how on how um, boots on ground combat would would work but what approach are you can what approach you have in mind when it comes to space combat well, initially it's going to be like a, a map, like a 2D map. But what I'm looking at, because we're going to be an online game, is we can probably make a gridded 3D map that you could move through. Mm-hmm. Like a very basic, just three-dimensional gridded map that people could fly through and do their stuff. Which, and since by... Speaking of that... Um... I do find it. I do find it an interesting setup that you're going with a semi GMless approach, where the GM is essentially a bot that you guys have have developed. Um, yeah, my uh, my coder is kind of amazing. Like I'm regularly humbled by what this guy can do. Has he sung the coder's drinking song? He doesn't drink. So oh. I. I don't think he has. He he has a allergic reaction to alcohol. Oh. Okay, that part I didn't know. Yeah. But like a real bad allergic reaction, yeah. so like he can't even like think about it. Yeah, it was only I was mainly referring to how you think you've gotten rid of all the bugs in the code, then then you and then more show up. I am not familiar. But I'm I'm kind of a luddite in a lot of ways. <laughs> Everybody is in something. But, but yeah, the other thing we're really excited about is the uh, social media aspect of our game. Mm-hmm. Because we really think that by having an in-character social media, we will get rid of a lot of the toxicity that exists within social media because number one we're a private entity so we can ban whoever we want and if people are saying awful things that are you know causing our users problems we can just ban them and all of their accounts and because it's a level-based system as long as we're like paying attention to the complaints that we're getting which is something that other social media companies don't do you know, we can essentially get to a point where by the time you've, like, third, four-star character, you're only encountering cool people that want to be there for what you want to do, because by then we've tracked the algorithm of how you play, and we're actually sorting you with people who play your style. Like, if we can tell that you're someone who just wants to play combat missions, we will set up combat missions for you and people that just want to play combat missions. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, if you're, like, diplomatic, if you want to mix, like, we'll be able to tell what we want. And because of the Wikipedia element of our system, where 
anyone can create anything they want on our system, any species, any planet, any star, any any adventure for people to play, you know, and then the idea is, you know, people will be able to look at an endless amount of content to play that's generated by other people. Because, you know, there's only so much cool stuff me and my team can come up with, whereas, you know, if I've got like 10,000 people playing this game, I'm really excited to hear what kind of stuff 10,000 people come up with. That seems way more interesting to me than stuff I think up, because, you know, I can think up my stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't get a lot of time in other people's heads. Um, trust me, you don't want to spend too much time in my head. <laughs> I'll take your word for that. Not un not unless you want to not unless you want a whole lot of sand checks. <laughs> but with that with that since you mentioned a star system, I'm guessing that's the that's your version of leveling almost in a tier like approach. Yeah, everything in our system is based off of stars. Like you have a star instead of ranks. Um. Right now, it's looking like people are going to be tier 1 to 10 stars. Um, and it, it's going to be calculated by a couple of different things. Um, backgrounds are going to have an impact. Like, But like, once we finish the sorting algorithm for character sheets and a couple of other things, one of the first things I'm going to do is just run a billion tests of the uh, system at every level. You know, just... AI is fighting each other and then just see where the numbers lie on encounters. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. I, I feel like that's something that Paizo, Wizards, all these other companies, they could do for next to nothing is just build an artificial metric of your system and then just test it a bunch of times in a closed system to see how balanced it is so that you don't have idiotic things that you're missing that, if they were properly playtested, wouldn't be there. Of course, it do doesn't exist. In Paizo's case, well, they have, a ha they have a habit of coming up with a good idea and then not following through on it. Yeah, that's what uh, I found so frustrating about Starfinder was... I feel like Starfinder should have been released with Pathfinder 2. Because it's like this stopgap between them where it's it's got some improvements but left some of the stuff that's that's unbalanced and and like the operative is just so overpowered compared to everything else in that system. Like Oh, par for the course given that Godzilla is still is still a problem in Pathfinder. But I mean like there's other S tier classes, but like the operative, it's in a tier of its own because it can be its own party. So can Godzilla. <laughs> Fair enough. I just at that point in time, I feel like you you've missed a design elements. Yeah. Like something shouldn't be so much better than everything else that when it's in the party, it makes everything else worse. And for the record, Godzilla, the cod part of that is cleric or druid because. A cleric or druid in D and D third edition or Pathfinder, who knows what they're doing, can be can um, outplay entire parties all by themselves. Yeah, I mean, if if you've got the fire domain as a cleric, I mean, great. Now you've got fireball and you're a cleric. <laughs> like it's it's just not fair. No, and I I know some people try and defend this kind of thing that that the that it shouldn't be balanced. I have ne I have never followed that li that particular line of thinking. Are you familiar with the three five diplomancer? I am. The character I that by level three can charm any character to a fanatical state of following, like go from hostile encounter to one hundred percent follow you every time. Mm hmm. It's it's hilarious. It's it does hilarious, require but a couple things out of the book of exalted deeds, yeah. like all of the vows. <laughs> Like, you're not allowed to participate in combat, but combat is you saying, please stop, and then everyone stops and loves you so much that they will do anything you ask. Which is not how this kind of thing should work. Yeah. It also doesn't it's... help the the um, 
the reputa the reputation the bard ends up getting st getting stuck with of of the of the guy who will sleep with anything. Played a bard, didn't sleep with a single character. But then again, it was a Dark Sun bard, so things were really weird. Like I was an assassin bard, because Dark Sun bards didn't get magic or anything useful, but they did get really cool poisons. This was second edition, and having a poison in second edition that does twenty point of damage on a failed saving on a pass saving throw and a failed saving throw, you just die. That's a really good poison. What do you do? You put those on throwing daggers because you get three attacks around with those. Yeah. Now, taking that in taking that into account, I despite the fact that this is that this is meant to be a um a full a full online approach, I'm guessing that I'm guessing that a good chunk of the rules would be in the wiki entry for the project. Yeah, uh, we actually have all of our rules listed along with uh, a chunk of our species on our website. Mm -hmm. And a lot of games have some sort of extra effort mechanic. Um, in something like World of Darkness, that's willpower. In Shadowrun, it's edge. In um, in some in something like the Star Wars FFG projects, it was light and dark side points. Do you have anything similar for Horizon Drifters? We don't. What well, well, we do, but it's not something that everyone's going to have. You're going to have to self-select it. And that is... Uh, crap, what's it called? Stellar... Star Chosen. Mm -hmm. It's a background that every time it gets selected, you get to, once a day, in a moment of crisis re-roll an entire die pool mm -hmm. with every die being the stellar influence die I can I can certainly work with that so that that could turn out very badly for you because if you roll a bunch of ones it's the well the dice gods show no mercy. Oh, man. Now the the dice are weighted in favor of you in this system. Like one thing we've we've debated doing is uh, the the stellar influence die subtracts, like multiplicatively the way it adds multiplicatively mm -hmm. or ad additively. Yeah, uh, like I'm not everyone. sure if multiplicatively is a word. You're, you're correct. Multiplicatively is a word. Yeah, but uh, no, it. Like, we're thinking about adding it so that every, if you roll a 1, you would then re-roll, and if you keep rolling 1s, you would keep select, subtracting. Mm -hmm. To make it more swingy. Yeah. Now, taking that now taking that into account, what... Do you have, do you have, um, do you have plans on, do, on doing an alpha test later this year or, or early next year? Yeah, right now we're doing a Kickstarter to see if we can raise the funding we need to just finish off the coding over the next couple of months. Mm -hmm. And then I've got a couple more places to go where I can potentially find funding after that, but they want me to exhaust all uh, revenues first. And also, I'm not necessarily sure I want to sell a chunk of my company because it would be coming out of my pocket, the investment. And if, you know, if I can start this without investment, mm -hmm. that'd be super. I mean, I've already invested quite a bit of money in this already. Oh, yeah. Like, I mean, we've, I mean, the art we have, I'm so, like, it just, it's so, like, the art style I asked for was Samurai Jack in space. And I really feel like my artist gave me what I wanted. Because mm -hmm. uh, we're just, we're going for a simple art style that's pretty easy to imitate so that when pe people are uploading their own images to our site, for their own species, it's not it's not super hard to mimic our style, so that there's kind of a consistency. I can I can certainly get that. That's and... that's actually one of my issues with a lot of gaming books is the art style is not consistent. Like the halfling in in the five E handbook is unforgivable. 
I look at that. I look at that as as them as having way too many cooks in the kitchen and not a unified voice. Uh, if I were to use an example of a of a of a unified voice in that regard, um, I'd think of the art the art direction in Exalted Second Edition, where not familiar. a lot of the art in that was done by Udon and Imaginary Friends, and between the two, between the two, because of the fact that there's a lot of overlap with their styles, it's the art style is able to be a lot more consistent. Um, and of course, the, and of course, there's stuff like Anima where a lot of the art was done, was done by Wen, um, Wen Yu Li, and he has a very distinct art style, or the stuff that was done by Six More Vodka for the Genesis. Um, the point is, this is that is that I think I think when it comes to art direction, there need if you're having a bunch of different artists with different styles, um, I think it's best to have so, to have somebody captaining the ship. Insane. Now I agree. I, I've talked to industry experts about this during this whole process about the best way to go about that because, like, once we get to the point where we launch and we start hiring more people, I'm gonna want consistency in what my group produces. So, I mean, I have an art director that's going to be part of his job is consistency in our material. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have the same kind of philosophy around our writing, although it's a little bit harder because one of our uh, content curators is Dan Burke. He's a stand-up comedian, professional game master. Um, and he... His stuff's just so funny sometimes. It's It's like not in the tone that we need it to be. But it's so funny that you just can't change it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like it's 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 written in a slightly different way, but it's 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 just it's gold. Like it it, it just we kept it the way it was, even though it it kind of breaks the narrative for other species. I think you yeah, can easily write that off. Book. Write that off as it as it being written in a in a certain perspective. That's well. That's that's funny you say that because like the Diasculpa, one of the things is he makes a lot of quotes in a perspective in the uh, in the system or in the uh, the entries. Because he did the Diasculpa, which are like sentient Venus flytraps, mm -hmm. who view everything as either food, not food, or building materials. Yeah, and have structured their society around that. But either way, I certainly look forward to seeing how Horizon Drifters will take shape. But with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. Well, thanks for having me. It's been a lot of fun. And anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present or not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!